All right, let's get into our study in the book of Ephesians chapter number 2. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll get started. Uh, we're going verse by verse through Ephesians. We're in chapter 2. Uh, the last three or four weeks, we've been looking at verses 1 and 2. So let's read down to verse 4, where we're going to be tonight, 3 and 4, and then we'll uh, have a word of prayer. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Heavenly Father, again we come to you tonight to say thank you for your word. Thank you for your word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, our most glorious Savior. Thank you for your scriptures, Father, we can study and, and hold in our hands to, to, to give us uh, the truth of this uh, most glorious Savior, the Lord. May we study his word tonight with, with uh, believing hearts and may, may, may it bring forth uh, uh, fruit unto your glory and for, edific for our edification. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Um, the last few weeks we've been looking at things uh, in verse 1 and 2. Look with me. That issue of quicken, we, we've done studies on that. That's to be made alive. Uh, we were quickened. We Gentiles in time past, we were dead. We were spiritually dead, separated from God's life in our trespasses and sins. We saw that those trespasses were robbing God of his glory. Okay? To rob God of his glory. And uh, we went through all of that, so if, if you haven't seen that, Ryan has already posted those on YouTube. Verse 2, wherein in time past, that time past was when God wasn't dealing with the Gentiles. In time past, God only dealt, Jim and I were talking about the Lord's earthly ministry. He tells his apostles, go not into the way of the Gentiles, in any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10, 5 and 6. And even in the in Matthew 28, when he sends, out, sends them out with the Great Commission, he says, you would not have gone over the cities of Israel till I come. Now, we know the Lord speaks the truth. He had not come yet because the, Lord, the Father, God the Father, changed the dispensation to where we live today, the dispensation of Gentile grace. And that's why Paul is in your Bible to explain that. So as you read Paul's epistle, look at verse 2. He says, in time past, ye, those Gentiles in, in, at Ephesus, ye walked according to the what? Course of this world. And Satan, well, we'll keep reading, according to or in line with the prince of the power of the air, we saw that that's the devil, the spirit that worketh, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Um, we, our last study last week was that every lost person is devil possessed, not just indwelt, like there are those who allow these devils to come in, those disembodied spirits that are in the Bible that Jesus was casting out in Israel. They need bodies. That's why they went into the swine. But they're just influenced by Satan, the course of this world. Satan is the one that runs. This, he's the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 2. So the course, the, the course that, the, that the world follows is that of the prince of darkness, the prince of the power of the air. By the way, he says the air. There's the influence. He, he, it, is, it, is, it, is of, it is outside of our terra firma. There is a higher influence. That's what he's talking about. We meet the Lord in the air and so forth. There's, there's this influence above us. He talks about the files of the air in Scripture, all from the beginning. Most of the time, the air is used, is used for the files of the air, like in Genesis, that God created. But the Lord Jesus said that when the sower sows the word, he says to Israel, and some of that, word, some of that seed goes on that, on that ground, and the files of the air come and devour it. He says the files of the air represent the devil, right? Remember that parable. So that's the influence of that ungodly influence of the devil that this world is ran by. Well, that's who we used to go by as lost people, as Gentiles. Look at verse 2 again. Wherein in time past ye, that's the, the member of the body of Christ, the believer, walked according to the course of this world. You know, children have school and so forth, the government schools. It's a course to teach them to be ungodly and not to believe God. Ultimately, that's the main thing behind it. It's the course of this world, the curriculum of this world. And it's according to in line with the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the devil. He's the spirit. He's a spirit being. He now worketh in the children of disobedience. We'll see more about the children of disobedience in a moment. He sure does. He sure does. We're going to see that, Dorothy. Watch this. In verse 3, he says, among whom? Among these children of disobedience. 
these lost people around us, among whom also we all, every one of us, had. Hopefully that's continuing, you know, that's a, 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 a past thing, right? We all had our conversation. Now that issue of conversation is not just a verbal conversation in the Bible. Conversation is a go back and forth. It's a back and forth. And when we dealt with the lost people around us, when we were lost, we went back and forth. And it was just these lost people, ungodly people, continuing that ungodliness. Well, we, we conversed with them in our manner of life and so forth. Look at verse 3. We all had our conversation, our manner of life, in time past. How did we operate as lost people? In the lust of our what? Flesh. Now watch how Paul defines the lust of the flesh. Fulfilling, bringing to fulfillment the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You're a spirit of your soul and your body. Your spirit is dead when you're lost, separated from God. Your soul has lust and your flesh, your physical flesh has lust. And whatever your mind thought about, you did. It was sin. Whatever your flesh wanted to do, we did. It was sin. Watch what he says. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by what? Nature. When you see that word nature, it means we were born this way. You know, we were talking about children. No matter how beautiful these little babies are. I, I work with seniors and on Halloween, some of their uh, children and great grandchildren and great grandchildren would visit. And one lady was talking about how beautiful this little uh, newborn baby was. And they, they wrapped it into a little costume. And she says, I thought it was a little doll. I thought it was a doll, but I realized it was a real baby. And then they, she was just going on. And that's what ladies do, go on how pretty and beautiful things are. And, 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 and I'm thinking in my mind, get that baby some time. Because the same lady who's raving about this beautiful child has a four-year-old great-granddaughter, my, my daughter's age. And she, she's like, you know, a bat out of hell. They said they can't control this little girl. She, the ladies has been on trips with us when they seen Jada Lynn. They said, oh, she, she's so nice. She can travel two hours. We go to San Francisco or Reno or whatever, two hours. She's like, because we teach her that. Because foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, the Bible says, right? And the rod of correction driveth it far away. You got as beautiful as that baby is, one day it's going to be, how, how do you say it? Even Judge Judy, she'll say about, you have to teach these children. They're uncivilized. We're to civilize them. Well, that's true. Because by nature, we're born sinners. And I don't care how beautiful they are, they're going to have sin. This foolishness bound, God says, in their heart. And that father's job is to, with the rod of correction, drive it far away. Well, by nature, we're children of wrath, even as others. Now, innocence is one thing. These young children are innocent. Until they get to the age of accountability, not age of accountability, we actually have a study on the website about, or excuse me, on the YouTube about accountability. There's not so much an age today like in Israel where you were 20, and under the law of Moses, at 20 years old, you had to start offering your own sacrifice. The, the people out in the wilderness, 20 years and up and so forth, were the ones who died in, in the wilderness, okay? But anyway, there's a more of an, an age of understanding where God holds a person accountable. That's different in every person. But when he says, by nature, the children of wrath, look at the end of verse 2 again. Notice in verse 2, he calls them the children of what? Disobedient. God wants obedient children. You can only have that in Christ. The children of this world, the people of this world, are children of disobedience. Notice what they're called in verse 3. And we're by nat nature children of what? Wrath. That means God's wrath is, is abiding on them. Once they move from that innocent stage to held accountable by God, the wrath of God abides on them. Paul says their, their life, if they don't get saved, is just treasuring up wrath, Romans, against the day of wrath and righteous judgment of God. And so the wrath of Almighty God for sin is abiding on all human beings who are not innocent anymore before God. And the only way to get the wrath of God off of them is to trust the shed blood of Christ. And that's what we did, and that's why Paul is telling us we used to be that way. Let's look at some more about this children of wrath. They are inherently evil. Go to chapter 5 of Ephesians. Look at verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 6. Paul talks a lot about this. Oh, the Ephesians. What did the book of Acts 19 says about Ephesus? They had a temple, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, called the temple of who? Diana. That's my sister's name. I always laugh when I read that. I have a little sister named Diana. 
in, in over in South Korea. Anyway, the fact is they worship and the whole world worshiped this temple, Diana, this, this, excuse me, this, this goddess Diana. They had a temple. And so when Paul talks about the course of this world, he's just not talking about the sins of the flesh. He's even talking about religious. Religion is the course of this world. Satan created, uh, or, uh, he, he counterfeited God's religion, okay? Ba uh, the, the, the Baal worship and so forth, the Babylon, you know, in Genesis 11 and so forth. He, religion, even that religion of the Ephesians, great is dying of the Ephesians, that temple, that's the course of this world too. Satan don't mind if you're in religion or he don't mind if you're in the sins of the carnal flesh. As long as he can get you not to be in Christ, he got you. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 6. Verse number 5. For this ye know, so don't act like these lost people, that no whoremonger, Today, that's called a player, a guy who got a lot of women. He, 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 he literally mongers whores. You know, he got a bunch of women. For no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. So you know that's not going to be in his kingdom, whether the one down here with Israel or the, or the heavenly places where the body of Christ goes. God's kingdom is made up of heaven and earth. The first verse of your Bible, the heaven and the earth. And God has given Israel the earth. And God has given the, the, the body of Christ. That's what he's created for, the, the heavenly places. So nobody's going to do any of those things in his kingdom. So don't do them now. Look at verse 6. Let no man deceive you. Just like the Corinthians, people were telling them, you can live however you want. Okay? And still please God, because once saved, always saved. You're right. You're saved by grace. Paul's going to tell us in Ephesians. No but it's not license to sin. It's freedom to serve, Right? So he says, let no man, verse number six, deceive you with vain words. It's going to be empty words. For because of these things, because of all those sinful things, cometh the what? Wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. He says, we used to be children of disobedience. We used to be children of wrath. He says that the wrath of God is going to come upon them. By the way, if you die in your sins, you're going to go to hell. And then you're going to be resurrected. At the great white throne judgment, your whole life will be reviewed and you'll get the, 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 the judgment of the lake of fire that, that God goes out to you because of your, your evil works. Um, if you live past the dispensation of grace, the rapture happens tonight, the next thing that's going to hit the earth, starting in the Middle East, is the wrath of Almighty God, the, 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 the great and notable, great and terrible day of the Lord, the wrath, the 70 week of Daniel, the Antichrist, the wrath of God. Well, that abides on people. And the only way to be delivered is if you trust Christ. Because if you trust Christ, then when the rapture takes place, you're going up with, with us, right? The body. But if you don't, you're going to endure that. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Ephesians and Colossians, they go together. Colossians 3, look at verse 5. Colossians 3 and verse 5. <clears throat> now, the book of Colossians, let me put this on the board. When you, when you look at the book of Ephesians and you look at the book of Colossians, a lot of things are, are, are very similar. They're what I call spousal books. We used to call them sister epistles, but they're spousal. Ephesians shows the church, which is his body. And, and in Paul, Ephesians 5, Paul says the church, the body is like the, the wife. Colossians focus on Christ. That's right, as the head of the body and the husband, okay? He uses those. When God created Adam and Eve, the husband and wife, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. When God created Adam and Eve, he had the body of Christ and Christ. He had this in his mind, what he's doing today. Yeah, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak. As Paul's talking about husband and wife, Ephesians, we're going to get there eventually if the Lord tarries, Ephesians 5. He's saying, hey, all that stuff about Adam and Eve, Hey, it's a great mystery, but I, it's a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ at the church. God had them in mind. Excuse me. God had us in mind when he created Adam and Eve. So they're spousal books. Spousals are even closer than uh, sisters. It's, it's spousal. We're, we're one. We're one flesh. Ephesians focuses on God's devotion to us. So Ephesians, it's about his great love and all that stuff. God devoted to us, the believer, the body. Colossians, it's a little different. It's our devotion to him. Now, one is constant. This is a constant. God always is devoted to the body. This one is not. This one's a choice of the individual believer. 
Because you'll see something written in Ephesians, it'll be from God's viewpoint how, how, how much he blessed us. Then you'll say, Paul says something similar to Colossians, but it's our, so Ephesians looks from God's viewpoint, Colossians says, here, you do it for him. That's why in, it's, it's in Ephesians, Paul talks about every name that is named, as far as every position in the, in the kingdom up there. He includes everybody. Paul don't go through all that in Colossians. He just says thrones, dominions, principalities. Paul mentions those thrones because your faithfulness, your devotion to Christ will, will get you these, this high calling of God in Christ. So Ephesians focuses on the church, God's devotion to the body. Colossians. The reason I say that, look at what he says in Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify. This is, is put to death. Mortify. A mortician, he deals with death. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. That's these fleshly bodies we have. Fornication, don't do that. Uncleanness, impurity, that's what it means. In order and affection, uh, affection that God hasn't ordained. Evil concupiscence, a mindset of just constant uh, debauchery. And covetousness, desiring more and more uh, ill-gotten gain. It, it, by the way, covetousness is idolatry. The lost people who have this mindset and do these things, look at verse 6. For which things sake, here's why God's going to put his wrath on them. The wrath of God cometh on the children of what? Disobedience. Disobedience. Verse 7, in which ye also walk sometime, that's the same thing as time past, when ye lived in them. So when we were lost, before we were saved, no matter how nice we were, I wrote this, check this out. I was thinking about it. I was thinking about these, these old ladies talking about, you know, how beautiful. But you, can I tell you, this? no matter how cute, handsome ladies, how pretty and beautiful and gorgeous guy, no matter how smart, no matter how nice, no matter how rich, if they're lost, no matter how soft they are in their spirit, because I've seen soft-spirited people, when you give them truth, they just turn like, you know, ready to beat you up. But that's, you know. Because of truth, no matter how, how sweet, handsome, pretty, beautiful, gorgeous, smart, rich, nice, all the Hollywood people that we see living out here in California, if they're lost, and most of them are, they're children of disobedience, they're children of wrath. Don't let that outward appearance fool you. Because Peter says what God desires is that inner man. Women, first, first uh, Peter three to the Israelites. She says he likes that gentle, quiet spirit, but it's one of a believer. And so, don't be fooled. That's how we used to be. That's how our neighbors are who are lost. And we need to get the gospel of grace to them. Go back to Ephesians, if you will. Ephesians chapter number two. All right. So that's what we used to do. We all know that. We don't have to focus a lot on that. But what's, what should we focus on? Well. In our study tonight, as you can see, I put up there, but God. Now, I could do a study on those two words, but God, and we could be here for, for months because it's mentioned all the way through Scripture, but we're just going to focus on Paul's. But God, when, when you see that term, something changes. Something is this way, but then God intervenes and something changes for the good. Now, it's mentioned many times, but we're just going to focus on a couple from Paul. If I'm not mistaken, I didn't write it down. Paul mentions it 18 times. Now, Bible num num numerics is fantastic. In Paul's epistles, but God is used 18 times, and they're fantastic. 18 in the Bible, you see, is a lot of different things. It's, uh, you can put one, one plus eight is nine, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, you can break it down three times six, uh, spiritual completion for man, so forth. By the way, the number 18 in and of itself, it has a dual meaning like five. Five is the number of grace. Oh, excuse me. Five is the number of death before the cross. Five, D-E-A-T-H, death. Then after the cross, C-R-O-S-S, -S, it means grace, G-R-A-C-E. Because of the death of Christ, you go from death to God's grace. Well, 18 is like that. 18 in the Bible is the number of bondage. But then it's also the number of life. Now, why is that? Think about this. In, in the book of Judges, many times it says that Israel rebelled against God and God put them under the bondage of the Moabites or whatever, 18 years. The woman in the book of Luke, who Jesus Christ healed her, she was in bondage to Satan 18 years. You know, that woman that he... 
So it, it bondage, right? Okay. And, and, and that's the state of humanity. But when God gets involved, what happens? You get life. And that's what's happening. By the way, I was thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ from age 0 to 12 in the book of Luke. You, you don't see him. Then you see him from 12 to 30. He was at the temple. Then he, he's baptized. He begins his ministry. That's a period of 18 years. Oh, I didn't even say this. Six times six times six. That's another reason with the, with the, uh, with the not six times six, six plus six, the Antichrist. But that's a whole nother thing. In those 18 years, 12 to 30, Jesus Christ, it says, at the last thing you hear at his 12, it says he submitted to his parents, right? He submitted to them. He was under their bondage, under their care, under their harness, their yoke, from age 12 to 30, that 18-year period, and then his life showed up. This is my beloved son. All those things are important there. So that's what's going on there, 18. And the 18 times that Paul mentions that, something has changed. It goes from bondage to life. Now, we used to be dead in sins, the bondage of sins. Look at verse 4. Look at Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is what? Rich in mercy. When we deserve death, when we deserve hell because of our sinfulness, we saw that the, the trespass of those uncircumcised Gentiles, is they, they took, well, they're down here. They took God's glory and made idols and worshipped idols. Eventually, Israel at, uh, did that too when they rejected Christ and they all fell. And that trespass was to reject the true God and serve idols and creatures. Well, look at chapter 2, verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy. And that mercy is the message that the Apostle Paul has. The reason why Paul is in your Bible, Jim, you asked, you said, didn't the 12 have the Great Commission? Sure they did. The 12 apostles to Israel, they had, then why is Paul there? Because when, when Israel rejected it, Stone Stephen, Saul shows up, they went down here. They joined the Gentiles in rebellion against God. No, God gave them an offer of that kingdom again. He did it. It was at hand with the Lord. The Lord went back. He sent the apostles, offered the kingdom. Today, that earthly kingdom is postponed. God's doing the heavenly kingdom. But here's what happened. When Paul was saved, what happens? God sends out this amnesty of mercy. He says, I'm not going to judge you Gentiles for that trespass. And he's offering grace and peace to the world through Paul's ministry of grace. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 4. But God, who is what? Rich in mercy for his what? Great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were what? Dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ. And Paul can't contain himself, parentheses, by grace ye are saved. He is the focus of this book of Ephesians, God, but God. His devotion to us. He doesn't pour out his grace based upon anything we do. Let me show you what grace means in the scripture. <clears throat> Un you, boy, look at you. See, that's why the people love you, Dorothy. That's why they love you, because you're a good student. I didn't know anybody could hear me. <laughs> oh, they could hear. They hear everything. Uh, grace. Now look at the, look at the, let's, me and Krista talk about how the business world, how the, how the, the corporate world use all these acronyms. Yeah. God's riches and There it is. God's riches. Riches. That's right. You, at Christ's expense, Right. Expense. He he did it at Calvary. It, it, oh, I got a, I got a number of these. Um, short. It, it's it's. Dorothy said it is unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. Okay. God's rich in Christ's expense. What He did at Calvary allows God to be gracious to us and merciful to us, and that's what the Book of Ephesians is all about. The Romans Romans two. Romans is the is the foundation, but Ephesians takes you right on up there to the heavenlies. And God's devotion to the body. Look with me, if you will, Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 4 again. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even where we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. You know, I think about the love of God. Everybody knows John 3.16. I was watching a football game, and they've been doing this for years. This was just past Sunday when we got home from church. You see the sign, right? Big sign, John 3.16. <laughs> When somebody's kicking a field goal. But remember when he wrote that in John 4, 22, salvation is of the Jews. So he was still focused on the Jewish people. He tells the woman at the well. 
Ye know not who you worship, salvation of the Jews. Today, salvation is not of the Jews. It's a, God has sent out his salvation to Gentile. And, and John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave, right? God gave out of love. But what John 3.16 doesn't tell us is how he gave. It doesn't mention the cross. Go with me to Romans chapter 5. Paul then takes that, that, that interdispensational concept of God's love to, to the world and giving his son. By the way, he, he's going to give his son in prophecy as the king of all the earth. And the, and the Gentiles will be blessed in that way. But before Jesus could do that, he had to do something first. He had to die. So look at Romans 5 verse 8. Here's how Paul describes the love of God. You may hear me end every session with this when I give the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God again. Start at verse 6, just for context. For when we were yet without strength. Yet means you're still without strength. No, nothing. Hey, when you're dead in your trespasses and sins, can you do anything? No, you're dead. You're without strength in due time. The dispensation of grace wasn't until Paul came, as you let this message be known, in due time, Christ died for the godly. Ungodly. Oh, the ungodly. <laughs> you mean to tell me I don't have to clean up my life first in order to be saved? Sometimes people say, I hear it. Oh, Brother Ron, I, I go to church, but I got to stop this, I got to stop this. I gotta... No, no, no. You ungodly. You're ungodly. That's who he wants. He died for the ungodly. Verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, it is some kind of Jewish things Paul's talking about with amongst the Jews. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Look at verse 8. But God, here's the one of the but gods we were talking about. But God commendeth. Commend means to put on display in a tangible way. Can you in human history look at an event that actually shows the love of God? Yes, you can. A human being who is more than a human being named Jesus of Nazareth lived on this earth. Many outside sources outside of the Bible know that man exists. Now, what they say about him is not so much what the Word does. The Word illuminates us who he was. He, he lived on this planet Earth in the Middle East, in Israel. He then died at age 33, a young man, and he died on a cruel and criminal Roman cross. Now, what you believe about that death, that man and that death on the cross, it means it's eternity for you. Because let's see what God says that happened. Verse 8, but God commended, he demonstrated and proved his love in a tangible way. <coughs> he commended his what? Love. God, do you love me? Yes, I do. Listen to what Paul says. Toward us, that's toward the sinner. In that while we were yet sinners, we were yet ungodly, yet sinners, still in our sin. You hadn't stopped sinning. You, how you, how's a dead man going to stop doing anything but being dead? You need life. 18. 18 times, but God, you're in bondage to sin and death. But when God gets involved, he gives you life in Christ. See the number 18. So when Paul mentions that 18 times, God takes the bondage away and gives us life in Christ. Let's look at that verse, verse, verse eight. But God commended his law toward us and that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. That's what John 3, 16 but, um, yes, and but Paul expounds on that. He died for us. And it's that sacrificial death at Calvary that frees us from the bondage of sin. And it's his word that actually frees us from the power of sin in our life. There's a salvation. Let me, let me put this. When you read Paul, he's going to talk, or the Bible talks about sa salvation or saved. It's in three tenses. To be saved or salvation or delivered, right? Salvation, saved, or delivered. You'll see these words, delivered. It's in a, it's from the very penalty of sins. That happens the moment you trust Christ shed blood. You're saved from hell in a lake of fire. But then in your walk, do we have the scriptures of God's grace to save us from the power of sin in our life? And also confusion. God wants you to know his word, understand it. Then the third thing is one day when the rapture happens, you're not just saved from the penalty of your sin, the power of sin, but what? What's that other piece? The very presence of sin. He's going to take us out of this world. Well, that's what the next part of that verse is. Look at verse 9. Look at Romans 8, 9. Much more than, now that he saved us, being now justified by his blood, there's the penalty of the sin. 
We shall be saved from wrath through him. You know those children of wrath? We won't get that wrath. We'll be saved from the wrath to come. Any wrath, whether it's the wrath of hell or the wrath of this day out here. We're out of here, okay? Verse number 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. We did a study on much more. That's a study too. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? Life. Life. See, we're in Christ. Verse, verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the power source by whom we have what now don't miss that word. Now we have now received the atonement. Israel is awaiting their day of atonement in the future. Israel in prophecy, they receive eternal life and, and, and atonement in the day of atonement in the kingdom out there. You and I as Gentiles today, by God's grace, that's what grace is. Unmerited favor, undeserved. We don't deserve it. He gives it to us the moment we trust Christ. If we they had accepted the Messiah, they would have gone right yeah. into the... Eventually. They still have to get the wrath. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It would have just yeah. gone right in. People don't realize that's why he was raising people from the dead. You're going through the wrath. Think about that. He, the reason why he was raising people... If we close this chart up, there's, there's some things they got to go through. And great question. Had they even had they received it, let's say he was there Dorothy, those four days and those four years of his ministry, almost four days that that lamb was supposed to be looked at most said, look at that thing for four days. Make sure it doesn't have spot or blemish. That's why his ministry was about three and a half to four years. And, and then he, even even that last Passover, he went for four days. He healed those lepers. It says, if you heal a leper, go talk to the priest, offer the sacrifice, you know Messiah, and all that stuff. He says, go and tell the priest, offer the sacrifice to Moses, because it's a testimony. They were supposed to say, hey, Messiah's here. They're going to take him in the temple. And just like Abraham did with Isaac, they were going to, the psalm says, put him up there and kill him. Shed his blood, wait for him to raise from the dead. Even if they did all that, the religious leaders, they still would have to go right on through the wrath. Because that was, that was, uh, Prophesied, it was agreed upon with the law of Moses. It's their atonement, but then they would have walked into the kingdom. They, yeah, yeah, well, that's true. They would have, by the way, from the time of his earthly ministry to his return, remember, he started at 30. The reason they tell you it's 30, because you can minister as a priest from age 30 to 50. Jesus Christ, and there was in one extra year, Luke 13, Jesus Christ's ministry would have been 21 years. He would have went up here, sat as we studied Hebrews as the high priest there in the temple, and he would have come back. So when he says there's some who stand here who should not taste of death till they see the Son of Man come in his kingdom, he meant that. He meant there were people listening to him preach here who would have lived all the way through here and saw him return. Now the reason it ha didn't happen because of the dispensation of grace, God the Father. But had the dispensation of grace not happened, they, they would have walked, people would have walked right into the kingdom. Even after the dispensation of grace and God begins the prophetic clock again with Israel, people are going to walk into that kingdom. There are going to be a group of members of the little flock of Israel who are going to walk right into that kingdom. Yeah. All right. So go back with me, if you will, to uh, Ephesians chapter number 2. All right. So what God's doing today with us, verse number 4, but God who is rich in mercy, and again, that mercy is a specific mercy associated with Paul's ministry. God is able to offer this amnesty for a time period because of the cross, and that's the message that Paul preaches, the preaching of the cross, okay? For his great love. See, God loves the Gentiles. Satan had the Gentiles. Nobody knew the Gentiles were in play. God was dealing with Israel. And then when Israel fell, Satan thought he had the victory. But the problem is, God already had the mystery. That's what the mystery is. God already had this plan called the mystery of Christ. Paul calls it the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery, Romans uh, 16, 25, which was kept what? Secret since the world began, but now it's been manifest. If Satan would have known about the mystery, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so when Israel fell, Satan thinks he's got the whole shebang done. And then here comes Paul, the chief persecutor of the little flock of Israel. God saves him by grace. Paul didn't even qualify to get saved. He had blasphemed the Holy Ghost, and you can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You won't be forgiven. That's the unpardonable sin. You can't blaspheme. Paul gets saved, grace, through faith, no works. 
God gives them a ministry of grace, sends it out to all the Gentiles. That's what God's been doing the last nearly 2,000 years. But one day soon, it, it, it's almost every day, it looks like, right? This thing is going to end. Both what's happening in the church and in the Middle East and so forth. One day soon, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Verse 5, Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead and... Oh, by the way, the great love. I was thinking about this. There are three needs that human beings have. Right? Well, three basic needs. You need a secure love, okay? You can't function without a secure love from birth, okay? Secure love. If babies aren't touched, they will die, okay? You need secure love. You need to be secure, okay? Secondly, you need a significant purpose. So you grow, you know, a significant purpose. You know, people say, what am I here for? Why, did, why are we here? The lost person don't understand why they're here. They just think there's some evolutionary thing from a baboon or something. No, you need a purpose in life. That's why they can easily take their life. Ugh, why am I here? You need a, a significant purpose. And then thirdly, you need a strong hope. You, you, need, you, need, you need some hope. I've seen lost people who will get interviewed because one of their relatives died. They'll be on the news talking about, I know he's in a better place. Well, how do you know that? <laughs> one, of my, one of my friend, Ron Salles, back in Illinois, he, he's a believer, and he was with some lost relatives in a limo, leaving a funeral, a burial. And one of his aunts were like, I know she's in a better place. And Ron, he's a tough guy from the mid, mid, Midwest. He goes, how do you know that? This was at the, right after everybody had been buried. He's talking about his own aunt. He, he, he says to his other aunt, well, I just know she's in a better place. And he goes, how do you know that? That sounded like Ron. He was just a tough guy. And she looked at him. He goes, how do you know she's in a better place? How do you know where she's at? So he was trying to get discussion, like talk about, you know, afterlife. We all need a secure love, a significant purpose, and a strong hope. And can I tell you that? We get all of that in a person. Who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 talked about, but God commended his love toward us and that while we are sinners, Christ died for us. What greater purpose than to now that you're saved, build up the life of Christ and, and, and be part of a grace ministry, knowing that you're, it's fruit abounding to your account. You actually have a purpose in life. You can wake up every day and say, I can serve God today in the grace of God. Study his word, do the work of faith, get it in you. That's what you guys are doing. Being a part of this ministry to get it out to others, knowing that you have a hope, a strong hope. There's the hope of glory. Now go back to Romans 5. Let me show you that. It's all there. Remember that verse? How many people want glory, though? Everybody does. Do they? Sure. You know how you know that, Dorothy? No. People will give up eternity to get glory in this world. You live, you, you live about seven hours from a bunch of them down in Hollywood. <laughs> Dorothy, That's they true. would give up eternity just to have be lights, camera, action today. <laughs> Those stars down in Hollywood. Star. What do you think a star is, right? <laughs> stars. What do you call them? movie stars? You know what Paul says about stars? They bear what? Glory. Life is all about that to the lost person. Get rich or die trying. Trying to get the reward here. Get it right here. Dorothy, I'm saying that you and I as believers, we, we choose that our glory will be associated to the judgment seat of Christ. Right. We're not trying to get the reward and glory now. Right. The, the, the lost world try to get it now. Think about this. Keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> Ryan and I, when, when y'all leave, we've been, we were talk, he was talking about some guy who parked this little fancy car. You know these people with these fancy $200,000 cars? They park them all weird. You know, don't touch my car. I don't, I don't park like everybody else. I park sideways. I park in the corners. Shut up. It makes you want to take your keys. It makes you want to go get it done. Look at my glory. Look at me. I'm so, look at my big house, my fancy car, my nice boat. No, that's you. That's, that's what this is. Glory with little G. Well, there's some glory with a big G associated with Christ, the hope of glory. Now watch this. Go back to Romans chapter 5. When he talks about his great love, what the grace of God has given man, if they want it, 
And they do, but they don't want to do it his way. They want it now. You got to secure love. Do you know when you trust the shed blood of Christ, you are saved? By the way, why do you think, before you all go there to Romans 5, go back to Ephesians 2. Look what Paul is saying in verse 5. No wonder he can't hold his excitement. Look at, look at Ephesians 2 verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, while we were yet sinners, have quickened us. What is that? Made alive us together with who? Christ. Christ. And Paul, because of his excitement, says, by grace ye might be saved. You are saved. When I talk about that secure love, what greater love than to die for you? You're saved. You're saved. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. But the what? Yeah. Yeah. Gift of God. By the way, he mentions the gift of God down in verse 8. He is eternal life. What type of life? Eternal. eternal life. You can't get more secure than having... E How long is eternity? Forever. Forever. I ask people that, brother Ron, you know, this is one say, I always say, what did that verse say? The gift of God is eternal life. How long is eternity? Forever. If it's eternal life, and the, for Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, the gifts and calling of God without repentance, he never changes his mind. When he gives you eternal life, he gives you the life of Jesus Christ. How long does Jesus Christ live? Eternally, forever. He only has immortality. He never dies. So my point is, that's a secure love. No matter what you do, you're going to heaven because you've trusted Jesus Christ. You're by grace, you're saved, not of yourselves. Now, now that you're saved, you now have a purpose in life. You don't have to say, well, what to do today? I don't know. Just, there's people like that. People just say, oh, well, what to do? Well, you got a purpose. Get on with the, your father's business. Go with me, if you will, to Romans chapter number five again. So you have a secure love. He died for you. He loves you enough to die for you. You have a significant purpose. Now that you're saved, he has a life for you to live. And then, by the way, some trouble's going to come when you try to live in this fallen world that Satan is the God of this world. Some, some tribulation, some suffering comes. When you do it the way Paul says to do it, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. 2 Timothy 3, 12. But what happens when you, the persecution comes? Do you give, give up and faint? No, because you have a strong hope. A hope of what? Look at, look at Romans 5. Start at verse 1. All right, so you got this strong, the secure law. Verse 1. Therefore being justified, declared righteous as it were, by how? Faith. Faith. That means taking God at his word. Paul says Christ died for your sins at Calvary. That's enough. You say, amen to that. That's enough for me. That's enough for God. So that's enough for me. There, you're saved. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace. Peace with God. No longer enemies. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the issue. It's through him. By whom? By Christ. Verse 2. By whom also. Now, this is going to have to be your purpose right here. Now that you're saved, what to do with it? By whom also we have what? Access. You have access. How? By faith. by faith. Now look, there's the first by faith, the moment you trust Christ. Now whether you trust Christ back in the 60s or today, that's a momentary thing. You have eternal life. There's that security. Eternal security. Then there's that life to be lived. There's the second by faith. Now this one is... This is saint. Yeah, that's right. This one's justification. Salvation. This one is sanctification, being set apart, holy unto God, and it's your um, justification, salvation, sanctification, and your edification. Okay? This is your purpose of life. By the way, what's your purpose in life? To grow in Christ. Let's look at it. By whom also we have access, how? By faith. We walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. This was the first faith. This is the other faith. By faith into what? This grace wherein we stand. So we stand in the grace of God. Now how do you access the grace of God? Each day. Faith. By faith. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. So you got to have the word of God. We have it. And you have to, by faith, believe the word of God. You have to believe it. 
There's your life. God said it, I believe it. That's right. Your, your purpose, here, you want to know what your purpose is? Jesus Christ, when we see Paul, he says, the word became flesh, and then over those 30 years, the flesh of Christ became the word again. Basically, Jesus Christ has spent his time getting the word of God in him. Believe in it, believe in it, and there it's going to bound to his glory. Well, we need to do the same. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's what we're going to see this issue of glory in a minute. Watch this. Let this mind be in you, Paul says, the believers, which was also in who? Christ Jesus, Philippians 2. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He's talking about the mind of Jesus of Nazareth as he walked. But made himself of what? No reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he what? Humbled himself, humility, and became obedient unto death, even, Chris and I looked at the death of the cross. That wasn't just the death like, like Isaac, uh, uh, one of faith by the people of Israel, had they received him. This was one of rejection. Wherefore God also highly exalted him that, and given him a name which is above every name, right? That at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee shall bow, things in heaven, earth, under earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And then Paul says, wherefore, my brethren, you do that. Think about that. If Paul takes, a, if Christ tells Paul, hey, take the body to when they would think how my mindset when I walked on this world, in this world, I want them to walk and obey you that way. Watch what we get. So we got that secure love. I don't need to tell you constantly. Maybe I do need to tell you constantly. <coughs> you're saved. Rest in Christ. I definitely need to remind you that, hey, there's a purpose to this life. Get that word of God in you. The word of God's grace. I commend you to God, Paul says to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. And to give you an inheritance. There's the hope. Look at this verse again. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in what? Hope of the what? Glory of God. What God has designed for the believer is to share in his glory. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God, that which belongs to God that he possesses. That's why when Paul later in Romans 8 says, heirs of God, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that's in the grace of God, that we might also be glorified together. When Jesus Christ is coronated king out here in the heavenly places, once the judgment seat of Christ is done, he's going to take us to the Father. The Father is going to crown him who in his time shall show who's the only he's going to crown him and those who are joint heirs with Christ will reign with him Timothy 2 Timothy 2 if we suffer we shall also reign with him Paul talks about that crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give us me at that day but not unto me only but all them that love his appearing when you give your life over to the grace of God there's your purpose your strong hope is the hope of sharing of his glory go over to 1 Corinthians on the way back to Ephesians, 1 Corinthians 2. I didn't make this up. What is the mystery about? The mystery is about sharing a bunch of Gentile heathens who robbed God of his glory in time past, trespassing all over his glory unto idols. He held back that trespass and said, hey, don't just be robbing me of my glory, sharing it with me. Because he says, I've done something for you. Look, look what Paul says here, the mystery. 1 Corinthians 2 Verse number six. Howbeit, by the way, you gotta have this wisdom of God. It's in Paul's epistles here. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are what? Perfect, that's spiritually mature. True. Yet not the wisdom of this world. You know that course of the world that Satan has? Mm. Who are we on that? Mm. Nor of the princes of this world that come tonight. All that satanic, but in, oh boy, in Colossians, he's talking about all these different new agents and all this stuff that comes along. 
Don't let that stop. Comes to what? Not. Nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. mystery. That's what the mystery is. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto whose glory? Our glory. The hope of Colossians. Whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the what? Hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man. So it's that, that secure love is he died for us. That significant purpose is he gives us this life to redeem the time to build Christ in us. And as we suffer for this message, because you will if you're building Christ according to Revelation mystery, you're going to have a strong hope of glory. That means you're looking for that judgment seat of Christ where he, by the way, it's fruit abounding to your account, he says. We sing this song. It's actually in our song book. We'll sing it. It's the one that says, I know whom I have believed. Go over to 2 Timothy 1. Let me show you what Paul is saying. At the end of his life, he, he's all suffering. We were talking about how Paul was in prison. The man's in prison for the truth, man. He's just suffering. And everybody's departing from Paul. He says, all they which be in Asia. Well, let's look at it. Look at first, uh, second. Did I say second Timothy? Yes. Second Timothy chapter, no, uh, chapter number one. Well, let's go to one. Where's my uh, all day? Okay, verse 15. This thou knowest, he tells Timothy, who's all crying and suffering too, that all they which are in Asia, that's where Ephesus was, we're in Ephesians, be turned away from who? Me. Then he names two teachers in particular, Phygelus and Hermogenes. All those men that Paul told Timothy to go to Ephesus and tell them to teach no other doctrine, they all, all those teachers went away from Paul except Timothy. But notice what he says in verse 12. For which cause? Talking about his... Uh, look at verse 8. Just look at verse 8. we got time. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. There's the preaching of the cross. But there's someone else too, nor of me his what? Prison. Prison. Paul. Don't be ashamed of your apostle. Watch this. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, as the gospel of grace, according to the power of God. There's the word and the spirit. Who hath saved us. There's your secure love. Watch it, watch it, watch it. And called us with a holy what? Calling. calling. There's your purpose. <clears throat> Set apart calling. Sanctify not according to our works, but according or in line with his own what? Well, look at that. His purpose is supposed to be our purpose. His own purpose in grace, which was given us in who? Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. That's what the mystery is. But is now, oh, we, we did the but nows, but is now made manifest. He put, he put it on display by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when Paul talks about the appearing, he's talking about that road to Damascus where he found out about this. Nobody knew this stuff until Christ gave it to Paul. Satan didn't know he was the most surprised creature. He said, oh boy, what's going on? Because if Satan would have known this, he would not have crucified the Lord. We just saw that. Verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and have brought life and immortality and light through the gospel. That's Paul's gospel of grace. Well, he tells you in verse 11, whereunto I am appointed a what? Preacher and an apostle and a teacher of who? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. That's us. That's us. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Paul was in prison for this. Nevertheless, now here's the song. I am not ashamed. What is, what is a what? Chris always talk about a one. Approved workmen are not ashamed. That's from the verse. That's the second part of this first part. Uh, no, approved work. A study to show thyself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2.15. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So it's the first part. Mm -hmm. Rightly, the middle part. Rightly dividing the word of truth. See, if you rightly divide God's word, you won't be ashamed. Paul's ministry stands out literally with this. Yeah, because there's a significant purpose God is doing with the body of Christ. Watch this. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to what? Keep. Keep what? 
that which I've committed. Yeah, he's, Jesus Christ is guarding something for Paul. Over Paul's 30 plus years of ministry in Christ, he had been doing all these things, building up the word, ministering the word, loving the saints, suffering with Christ. And all that was fruit abounding to his account at the judgment seat of Christ. He's just building up this huge bank account of glory. For we know that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, Romans 8. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for a far more exceeding eternal weight of what? Glory, 2 Corinthians 4. Why Paul keeps talking about the sufferings and his glory? Because he's over his over your life as a grace believer, you build up this, this account. Watch this. Um, do we really suffer though? Here overseas, yes. But do we really suffer? But see, you gotta you gotta remember, suffering comes in different things, Dorothy. Suffering can be in oh physical. See, when we think of suffering, we automatically think physical suffering. Right. But because you are a <clears throat> a human being who's made up of both uh, spirit, soul, and body, don't th don't think that only suffering. Most of Paul's suffering over the course of his lifetime was mental and emotional suffering for the gospel. For the gospel's sake. See, look, watch this. And here's what I want to show you. The issue in suffering with Christ. How, how does Jesus Christ suffer today? Well, he did physically. No, no, no. I mean, right now. Paul says he's suffering now. Okay, watch this. Jesus Christ, he says, if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. How is our Lord suffering today? Is, is Jesus Christ suffering physically today? No. no. Emotionally. He's suffering rejection of his word in his own world that he long, created. Long suffering. Yes. It's long suffering. It's for the Lord. It's the. Well, see, I'm going to show you because Paul had. It. Go with me back to Second Timothy. Great question. What Paul is talking about is suffering for truth, for truth, and it's not always physical suffering. By the way, the Muslims suffer for their religion. If you are a Shiite and you're in a Sunni territory or whatever, I don't know, they fight amongst themselves. They kill each other because you're not the right sect. Whether it's Islam, certain sects of other religions. So people suffer for their faith. But the particular suffering Paul is talking about is how Jesus Christ suffers today. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, doesn't suffer physically, although you can, if you like Paul. But really, it's the suffering of rejection of truth. It's the anguish of re a rejection of truth, you and the truth. Dorothy, let me tell you something. You keep believing this and trying to share with others. You're going to watch your friends go... <laughs> You're going to watch your family. You'd be like, uh, does the phone work? I haven't heard from you. Well, that's because you've been sharing about Jesus. See, Dorothy, you're going to suffer anguish of heart for rejection for the truth because that's how Jesus Christ suffers. Look at, look at 2 Timothy again. We're coming down here. Look at verse number, chapter 1. Look at chapter 1. Verse 3, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers. This is Timothy, right? Yeah. Greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy what? Tears. Now, were, were these tears of joy that Timothy were, was crying? Let me answer. No. <laughs> Timothy was suffering mental anguish because he stood with Paul, and as Paul was getting rejected, Timothy was getting rejected. People were leaving left and right. He had a little tiny assembly like this, and he looked around. And, and, and everybody goes to the big church in Ephesus, you know, greatest the, the, the temple of Diana, because Paul's in prison. It looks like, how's God with Paul? He's in prison. How's God with Timothy? He got that little bit. Timothy was in anguish because of the truth and how people were rejected. How Jesus Christ, our Lord, long suffers today is in the truth of the mystery of Christ, his doctrine. And Dorothy, every time someone rejects the gospel of grace, yea, the, even the rightly divided word amongst the saints, it hurts the heart of our Lord. Let me show you the suffering. I, you got I, it. I've experienced that. Well, we, you, 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 you stay faithful to you and experience a lot. I just didn't realize that that, yeah. was, that was the suffering. The, to, point, the point is what you're suffering for, not the level of suffering. Right. It's what you're suffering. It's not the 
quantity of suffering, it's the quality. It's the quality. Here, I'm going to show you. Keep, keep your hand in 2 Timothy 1. I want to show you something that just, it, this nails it right here, uh, how God suffers. Go with me to Ephesians chapter number 4. We're going to get to it eventually, but <laughs> did you know that God suffers? Well, sure, Christ suffers. Let me show you how he suffers. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Now, now that sounds funny that God suffers. Is anybody up there sticking God with a sword? No, it's no. Not nobody's physical. sticking the Lord Jesus. They're not physical. It's not, a physical. it's not a physical suffering. But let me show you something. Notice it says, verse number 30. Ephesians 4, 30. And what? Grieve, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know what grief is? Yes. Yes. You, if, you are, if, you are, if you're a parent, you, you experience grief, don't you? You know, I could finally say that with a four-year-old. <laughs> and I don't, and, and it, you got a 60-year-old son, and they got 40-something-year-old children. Look here. What is grief? It is an emotion, isn't it? Yes. Did I spell that right, Mother? My mother is my uh, spell checker. I before E is I before E is To grieve is an emotion. You mean to tell me the Spirit of God can grieve? And grieve not. Why would Paul tell you to grieve not him if he couldn't? Grief is an emotion. So what I'm saying, Dorothy, most, well not most, the way that Christ long suffers and, and grieves and so forth is the rejection of his what? Truth, his word. And you know what the judgment seat of Christ is. It is the ultimate payback for believers who reject his word through Paul. What the day of the Lord's wrath is, is the ultimate payback for those people in that world who rejected his word. They received not the love of the truth, they might be saved. You know what the great white throne is. It's the ultimate payback for the righteous, from the righteous judge to those who reject his word. Now as we end, go back, I told you to stay in 2 Timothy 1. Let me end on what, what I was saying and we'll have a Q&A. 2 Timothy 1. Now watch this. No, no, no. Dorothy, I tell you, they, they love you. Wait, wait till, I'm going to show you on Sunday. I'm going to read that thing. Okay, so 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, the Paul suffered for the mystery of Christ. If you suffer for the mystery of Christ, and it doesn't necessarily have to be physical suffering, Dorothy, or anybody, it has to do with what you suffer for, not how you suffer, what. Verse 12, what does Christ suffer for? For the which cause I also suffer these things. By the way, I'll tell you what, Paul's more focused not on the physical suffering of being in prison, but the mental anguish of people rejecting the truth. Yeah. And that, you know you suffer that way too. All right. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep, that keep is like guard, safeguard, that which I have committed unto him against that yeah. day. Here's what Paul is saying. I'm going through this suffering, men is rejecting it, but I know Jesus Christ <coughs> gave it to me. He gave it to Paul through supernatural means. He wrote it down for you and me in Paul's epistles. He says, as we keep this and, and, and build it up in us and in others, you're going to suffer for it. You're, it's, it's fruit abounding to your account at the judgment seat, and the Lord's just collecting it up. And at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to take that which you've committed to him, and he's going to give it back to you, abound it back to you, greater than. A little bit of, of suffering abounds to a greater weight of glory. Wait till Sunday when I show you about that from 2 Corinthians. I can't even. Paul in 2 Corinthians, he said, Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. I see why he said that. Because Paul could not put into words what happens when you give even a little bit to a grace ministry. That was the point of it. He goes, it's like a seed that just abounds at the judgment seat of Christ. It's, it's, it's nuts. You got, you'll be, I know. It's exciting. It's exciting. All right. If you're here today, not you guys, if you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, you know for sure you're going to spend eternity. I love you. These saints love you. That's why we have this ministry. But we, as we saw today, more importantly, God loves you. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8, but God commended his love, his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, shed his blood at Calvary so that he might be your sacrifice for your sins. If you trust him and him alone, no works of your own, God will save you this moment. Now, when he gave you that, gives you that eternal life, he now has a, not just a secure love, but he has a significant purpose for your life. That's building Christ in you. 
And as you do that, you're going to suffer for it. But when you do, he gives you that strong hope of glory. And you can have that. And by the way, the rapture is sure to, is soon to come. So redeem the time. We'll help you with that. All right? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can get into your word each day and a couple times a week with one another and, and, and learn the things of the Lord Jesus Christ as, as he's laid out in the scriptures. Father, we thank you for the encouragement of flesh and blood saints here. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't have that uh, local grace assembly to attend and, and who follow by way of the internet. May, the, may, may these studies encourage their hearts as they're with us in spirit. But we are thankful and we don't take for granted this, this opportunity to be part of a local body of grace, uh, saints, of, of believers who love your word and, and, and love to minister it one to another. Thank you for this opportunity as we have our uh, time together in Q&A and, 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 and uh, sharing in the word. We give you thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.